demo tonight. And then we're going to have um, uh, announcements, brief announcements, take a break for refreshments. And we have a special uh, for the refreshments tonight. And uh, for re refreshments, the silent auction. Then we'll reassemble for the challenge, which is a wall button, and finish up with the show and tell and be out of here by 9 o'clock. Let me get started since it is a um, special event tonight. Uh, I don't know, don't think many of you have seen this yet, but let me roll, have this rolled out here, Linda. If you can roll the, oh yes. This is, <laughs> I didn't see it when it was completed, but this is really something. Uh, something to look forward to for the refreshments tonight. Um, you gotta take a look at this. This is a work of, again, a work of art. Right up here in the <laughs> with a lathe on it, no less. That's incredible. Who's re who's re Thank you so much. Great. This is Kevin, uh, Mrs. Turk, Kevin's wife. Your first Kathy. name? Kathy. Kathy. Thank you so much. This is that you outdid yourself. That's incredible. So that's really neat. Anyway. But where are the carbide tools? I didn't have time to whip them. Raspberry and lemon is the stump. And then the lathe and the hat are um, Rice Krispie treats. Now, is, oh. the lathe, is the lathe a jet mini lathe or? No, no I don't know anything about lathes. So okay. It doesn't look like one, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. No, it's great. It's dirty, it's 25 years old. Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, thanks. You can roll that back and put that yeah, in the back. Thanks, Kevin. That's wonderful. Okay. Uh, let's get started on this. First of all, um, like I say, uh, we haven't, we've allowed an hour for this, and this time is just going to go by like that. And so what we're going to do is establish some ground rules. I don't know if Jack has on the slide, we can take a look at uh, ground rules. But to get the most out of our panelists and provide information that the audience has really been interested in, I interviewed a number of members to find out you know, what do you really want to learn from these people? What do you want to know? And so uh, what, we're, do what we're, <laughs> we're doing here is, uh, please, if everyone will silence your phone, we're recording this tonight, and so we want to make sure that we're not interrupted by that. Uh, we want to engage in a dialogue, a lively discussion, and we want everyone to uh, participate, although not everyone has to you know, respond to every question. Uh, we're going to take questions as we go. And so we have a um, microphone up front here, and then if you just, uh, audience members have a, a question, raise your hand and we'll get to you, get a microphone to you. This, we can hear each other in this room, but unfortunately it wouldn't record, so I hope we're going to try to do that. Um, so take questions as we go. Uh, everyone get involved in the co uh, conversation. Be additive, not repetitive, okay? And uh, most of all, have fun. So. Let me uh, start off by saying, um, on July 19th, 1994, 14 people gathered at the Lenox, Kansas Woodcraft Store to discuss the development of a new AAW chapter. The Kansas City Wood Turners is now celebrating 25 years of turning and almost as many years being affiliated with the AAW. Initially, members got together at people's houses between meetings to learn new techniques. Given the and given the general advanced age of our club members, we're delighted to have a number of those first year members still involved, okay? That may sound familiar. Uh, I just read that from, uh, it was written by our investigative journalist, uh, uh, published author, and oh yeah, our secretary, Mr. Sean McMahon, appearing in the current issue of American Wood Turner, page 10. So, and my copy is even autographed, okay? Wow. So, I, I got that to 
yes. Anyway, uh, like I say, this fact is virtually unheard of, that you've got people that you know, participated and uh, been around as long as, as many of our members here have. So uh, what we're going to do is, uh, as Paul Harvey would say, you know, learn the rest of the story. And now let's meet our panelists. What we'd like to do is we should have a microphone that we can pass. OK. If we could have uh, everyone just get, say your name, um, how many years you've been turning, and how many years you've been a member of the club. So we can find out if you started turning before you were a member of the club. And softball question to get everyone talking initially. So just a brief comments. My name's Stuart Shanker. I've been turning since I've been a member of the club. And I don't know how many years that is, but uh, it's been really fun, and this club is amazing. Thank you. I'm Rick Bywater, and I joined this club in 1999. And uh, I probably first turned as a sophomore in high school, but I didn't, I mean, that was in high school. And then, so then I probably have been turning for 21 years. Uh, Jerry Darter, and you know, I was thinking on the way down here, I'm not really sure how long I have been a member, so I decided I was going to say I've been a member for over 20 years, and I think that's accurate. <laughs> uh, I'm Judy Chestnut, and I think I've been a member since about 2002. The first time I turned was at the Kansas City Art Institute. I turned four bedposts with a roughing gouge because that's all I had there to use. So <sighs> a lot of sanding. Jim Lambie, I've been turning since high school 1970 and was original member in the club 25 years ago. And probably the biggest difference between now and back when we first started is Kevin and Anthony are a lot harder to keep up with now. Mm -hmm. Didn't your dad bring you to the first yes. meeting? Okay. I'm Linda McMaster, and I joined when Jerry did in 2001. Hey, and Jerry, I heard I'm Linda McMaster, and I have been a member since 2001 when Jerry and I joined, and he'll explain about that later. And I watched and learned, and then several years later turn, started turning some things. And we've taken several classes at Aeromont, which really help. See, when your wife sits beside you, you don't have to say anything. <laughs> 2001, and I've been turning since then. Hi, my name's Kevin Neely. I joined in, uh, let's see, August 1994. I'd been turning for about three or four years because I, I had a, a, a bull that I had stamped with that year on it that I still have. So it's for sure that's when I started turning. So it's, it's a long, long time. And I joined this club because I had a lot of questions about turning. Uh, when you started that long ago, there wasn't a lot of support for, for turners. And, and it wasn't good support if there was any support. So I had a lot of questions, and everyone that, that joined when I did had a lot of questions. So, uh. Uh, I'm Ed Jazik, and I joined in March of 2011. So I'm the youngie up here. And uh, I think I started turning probably maybe 10 years before that. But compared to what everybody else was doing, I'm, I have no doubt I didn't know what I was doing. A lot of sanding, that's for sure. My name is Don Gruss, and I've been turning since uh, high school. I've made a drop leaf table that has gone through two generations and had to be refinished, so it's still around and in service. So that was in 51, I think. So then I joined the club when it was meeting over Woodcraft at the beginning, sometime whenever that was. My name is Anthony Harris. Uh, I think I started turning in 68 or 69. Uh, I was at the first Woodcraft meeting. Uh, the only thing I say about that original turning in 68 and 69 is uh, they didn't tell me you had to sharpen anything. <laughs> and uh, I found that the diamond point scraper, you know, we don't use them anymore, but the diamond point scraper, if you pushed hard enough, it'd tear wood off. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess the other bit of wisdom is 80-grit uh, sandpaper used for a long, long time never becomes 220. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Chip Siski. I uh, started in 1995 
with the group and turning just slightly before that I went to the woodworkers guild and took some turnings there and someone took pity on my soul and said you're in the wrong place I have somewhere to take you and that's how I got involved great Jim my name's Jim Reynolds I think I started turning and also joined the club in 2000 um, got several things up here that you can come look at but I got a picture of the lathe that I turn on today that was the first lathe that Kansas City woodworkers ever had and I bought it at one of the auctions wood turners I'm sorry and I've also got the first box I ever made up here and I made it at the club I came in that morning and uh, Bud Schenke helped me sharpen my old worthless tools and a little bit later Anthony helped me make the box and there's a story that goes with that I was turning with Anthony's tools and pretty soon he said turn off the lathe he said didn't you just sharpen your tools I said yes uh, he said why don't we get your tools if you're going to try to cut the chuck, use your tools. <laughs> uh, my name is Bill Coleman. I, uh, I've been turning since uh, 2000. I actually turned a little bit before that, but not much. Uh, I started out turning spindles to replace some old antique spindles. And uh, I've been here for a long time. I've been, I'm the guy that makes the name tags. Uh, <laughs> When Merrill Schneck was president of the club and, and Kevin was taken over as treasurer, he needed somebody to help Kevin out. So I've been kind of I've been kind of a help to Kevin is what I've been doing. So anyhow, that's uh, enjoy. Great. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone. Let's pick up the pace now, and uh, I'm going to throw out some softball questions and have. Um, let's see. Four balls and you get. Jerry's going to be the first one. How did you first learn about Kansas City wood turners? Wow. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I've been in, doing some kind of form of woodworking uh, since uh, my freshman year in high school in, in ninth grade shop. But uh, more than 20 years ago, I went down to uh, Paxton uh, Woodwork Store down to be, used to be up northeast and walked in, and here's a guy working on a lathe, turning pins and uh, he was using a, uh, a parting tool to turn those pins and uh, of course we, we've moved on beyond that now but I was just uh, I was really mesmerized by that I'd never really thought that you could make a pin and so I watched that whole demonstration and uh, uh, when I got through I, I, I knew about woodcraft so I went over there and they had a whole stack of belt drive record mini lays and I bought one of those and, and bought the, uh, well, no, it came with uh, a beginner set of tools, probably five or six tools. And uh, anyway, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of that's when I started. Great. Anybody else have something different to add or? Yeah. I when, I, when I retired in 2001, my wife was worried that I wouldn't find anything to do and drive her silly. So um, I retired in August and we went to a fall uh, art show and we ran into a booth and Russ, Russ Blazier was there and uh, he was a longtime member of the wood turners and he always had, did shows and was a fine turner. Got to talking to him and he says, well, you need to go to the Kansas City uh, Wood Turners Club and he told me where it was and so month or two later we decided to go and the very first meeting we attended happened to be the auction oh. and uh, they had an old Sears lathe there they were sure they'd never get rid of I paid 50 bucks for that lathe <laughs> and Jerry Darter, Darter and Don Gruis mm -hmm. we loaded it I think in the back of Jerry's truck and they delivered it to my house and Don thought we lived at the edge of the world he never found the house <laughs> again. we live out in the woods west of Peculiar so it was tough to find but that got everything started for me. So, great. Uh, does anybody remember Chris? Is it Kunzel? Yeah. Okay. 
He was demonstrating at Woodcraft uh, some Saturday, and he was doing a box out of cherry. And, and I just happened to walk in because I was doing a project, and uh, I sat there and I watched Chris demonstrate this uh, uh, box, and it, and it was just almost kind of like like something like this, okay? And and when he did his lid, he did his lid like I did. I mean, it was a little bit loose, and as he was trying to turn the lid. The only thing that he could figure out is he put a piece of uh, paper towel between the, the, the main part and this part so that he could then finish that lid. And I sat there and I looked at that and it was like, wow, this guy is really cool. He knows what he's doing. And so he told me about the, this club. Otherwise, who knows? I still may not be a member here. So word of mouth seems to be uh, the way a lot of this, uh, people learned about the club. Okay. Why did you join? What was it that made you want to join this, this club? I, quit <laughs> <laughs> I, I found the club to be a resource of both technique, but more so personalities. This was a very diverse group of people who I could learn from, and hopefully over time, maybe even try to teach something if, once I learned it, but it was, the, it was the people that really kept me here. Real quick, you guys are spoiled because when, when I joined, we were in a broom closet. I'm going to call it the broom closet over there. At, was it Metro? No. Uh, it was in the lumberyard. It was in a lumberyard, but it was, lumber. it was back in their file cabinet room. So we might have had like 30 people that would show up for, for a demo there. But, but the big thing was, is I think being introduced uh, in high school to the lathe uh, brought out this creativity thing for me. And, and I still love the turning because of the creativity that, you know, you could put a piece of wood on there and have no idea what you want to make and just go to town and come up with something. In, in, in doing the tools over here, you got to have your plans all organized. And remember, you measure twice and cut once. Well, you know, with the club, you have access to a lot of talent out there. And you, and you can actually, on Saturday mornings around here, you can become a, a decent turner. Uh, and then you have some pretty good people to associate with in addition to that. But really, I think that the thing that drew me in more than anything else was probably the cookies. <laughs> okay. It wasn't the so, coffee. No, it was a good <laughs> tell us, tell us a little bit of what the club was like then. I mean, we were kind of getting to that, and that's what I think we want to. Audience wants to know, learn a little bit about what what it was like then. So you well, kind of met in a broom closet, and how many people well, were there? Well, it, it was first. It was a small group at Woodcraft in the back room, and most of the turning was done in the show and tell in people's own shops because we really didn't turn a lot in Woodcraft, and we stayed there until they decided to make that a full uh, rentable wood shop, which they don't have now, and so then we moved from there to the lumber yard, and we did start in a broom closet, and then we were moved out of there into the main showroom, so we had to put all the chairs and put the lays away, and then finally the lumber yard sold, and a friend of mine owned it, so we got the basement, which used to be the Lee Jeans, wholesale house and we stayed there oh, okay. for many years we had free rent and then towards the end they started charging us rent and utilities but uh, pretty much most of the show and tell and all the turning was done in different people's shops so we traveled around a lot and uh, it was a lot of fun. It, it, in, at Lee Jeans it was when uh, we joined with the Woodworkers Guild. Oh, they came, they actually came with us. They sublet from us. And they, yeah, because we were starting to have to pay rent. And that helped out this 8,000 square foot. Yeah, during the recession, they decided to not give us free rent anymore. So we had to start paying. But we got to stay there for a long time with no rent. And, and I think the reason we're here today is because he didn't like the woodworkers guild, I think, if I remember right. And he said, you guys need to go find a new they place. Took up a lot of parking places. Well, they create a lot of dust and just the, they were, they were getting big fast. Well, this was a lumber yard, right? Right. Or yeah, was it was down in the basement of a lumber yard, but it originally started in a storage closet. Yeah. Mm. 
Okay. Well, we, we, we moved from upstairs to the storage closet to the main showroom and then to the basement, which was a nice space. The true story on that is uh, one of the uh, Woodworker Guild members pissed off the owner, and the owner just says, get the hell out of here. That's the true story. I know what happened. I, I, I had known the owner since 1964, so we were old friends. Mm. Greg. The writing was on the wall. What? They were starting to, the upstairs was starting to be different things. They, they were wanting to hold wedding receptions there, which yeah. didn't suit uh, all the machinery going. It didn't work out too well. So they wanted mm. to be quiet. They didn't like the noise. And uh, that, then there was a, uh, the car dealer <coughs> after a while, and they, they just wanted to repurpose the upstairs and, and all this noise going on right below their feet wasn't part of their plans. So they they let us know we better start looking. Yeah. And we but, found this place. But but it was a good deal because we got it for free for a long time and we we didn't have much time to uh, find a new place when Woodcraft kicked us out. We also went through one flood there. There were a lot of reasons to get yeah. out of there. Yeah. We're mm -hmm. glad we left. This yeah. has been the best place we've ever had. So there have been a lot of changes over the years, huh? What's remained the same from the early days to what we're doing now? Nothing. The good friendship. A lot of the same members have stuck with the club the whole time. Many of the old members have been with us a long time. Okay. One of the things, Mike, that I remember as I look at this group, the first, the first morning I walked in to a meeting, there were four old men laying down on the floor trying to see whose top would spin the best. <laughs> and all four of them are still sitting up here. <laughs> they weren't old men then. <laughs> okay. I got a question. Let's have a show of hands here. Okay. How many of you expected to be here tonight when you first started with the club? <laughs> That's great. That's incredible. I didn't think anyway. I mean, when you join an organization, you think, yeah, 25 years or, you know, from now up, I'll still be around. <laughs> That's amazing. So I want to move to some questions about AAW. And I understand that was one of the big advantages of, of forming the club and everything under the auspices of AAW. Am I kind of right here? or? I did, I did a little bit of research. I called AAW uh, and found out when our club became a, a chapter, a charter member. And it was two months before our first meeting. Our first president, John Larson, he, he worked at the Shopsmith store at 95th and Quivira. And, and he's, he got me to join. He told me about it because I had gone to that store to look for tools. Was, I, I think it was a good source for, for lathe tools. Anyhow, he told me about the first meeting. But uh, John Larson, our first president, had got the ball rolling with AAW just a couple months before our very first meeting. And so we were already a chapter when we had our first meeting. Great. What, how was the AAW involved in the club at that time? Did they provide a lot of resources or, or I, I, I really don't know. They were a pretty young club or an organization themselves, so they didn't really do that much. They had a magazine, and they did their best, but they've improved a lot over the years. They're, they're immeasurably better now than what they were back then. A lot more support. But back then, they were, they were a little bit of support. The magazine was still a good magazine because none of us knew anything back then anyhow. Uh, mm -hmm. We all know a lot more. But uh, they didn't really help us or drive membership much. Uh, mm -hmm. I think our big, our big year, though, was in 2005 Symposia? Mm -hmm. right. And uh, that, that opened, I think, everybody's eyes. That, that was great. Now, that was the first symposium that we went to, yep. and we've gone to a lot of them since. And just the atmosphere there and the learning from the demonstrations, are, it's wonderful. That's, that's what AAW helps, that in the journal. I'm, I'm kind of getting the feeling that initially, I mean, I look like all AEW did was, you know, send out a, a magazine every, you know, what, six times a year, and uh, that was about it. But it seems like 
the perception, I mean, has changed. I know with the Vision 2020 or 2020, there's a lot more that uh, AEW's getting involved with and everything. So can you comment about that and what, uh, you know, how the perception of uh, AEW from the members has changed or has it? Well, I think right now they, they have a lot more news events. They've got a lot more instructors. There's a lot of online videos if you want to get online and see how to do things, which they've never had. Um, I think in the last five years, they just put out a lot more information to help people learn. Mm -hmm. I think the internet has changed a lot. AEW has embraced the internet. Internet has changed a lot. Uh, it's been beneficial to everybody. More storage for videos and things like that. More access to information. It's it's a tremendous deal because to join the AAW is sixty dollars a year. I belong to the Barbershop Harmony Society. It costs me hundred and seventy four dollars a year, and they're monopoly. Every single person in our chorus has to belong to them. None of you have have to belong to the AW if you don't want to. But I'll tell you what, I encourage all of you to join the AEW because that magazine alone pays for itself. It is an incredible magazine. I, I, we get, what, six a year? And, uh, and you have to go to an AEW symposium, that's for sure. They let you sing for $174? Absolutely. You, you, are you going to come uh, to our show in September? <laughs> to, get, to, to give you an idea, at the uh, AEW symposiums, they will have six or eight classrooms going for the two and a half days, and they change every every two hours. And uh, there's no way on earth you just got to go down through the schedule, pick out who you want to see, and figure your schedule. And you know, uh, it's it's great if you get ever get a chance to go to the symposium, do it. You know, it's it's you'll learn more tricks. You'll learn. You'll meet people from all over the world. Uh, one year, I uh, I was a, a camera assistant to some the Japanese Turners. They were here from Japan. And that was interesting because they do everything completely different than we do. But uh, it, it was quite an experience. So if you ever get a chance to go to an AAW symposium, do it. If you had other hobbies where you've tried to find people who you could learn from mm -hmm. or you could say I really would like to learn this technique but I don't know anybody who actually does that having a professional organization that gives you access not only to techniques and people and information on a national basis but this is an international club this is an international group of people that if you don't know how to do something and you're in England and you want to learn how to do it, there will be a person there who you can do it with. So the educational aspects are worldwide and the technique ability for you to be able to learn something